and welcome to our Ethics Center panel on renaming S Valley. Um, I'm Andrew Fiala and I'm the director of the Ethics Center here at Fresno State. And thank you for joining us on Friday afternoon. Um, we appreciate you being here. Let me stop this screen share. Um, so uh, hello and welcome again. So this is part of our, um, our Ethics Center lecture series. We do a dozen or so of these kind of events every year. Um, I'm really excited that we can do this because today is Native American Day in California. So it's kind of cool that we could coordinate this event on this day. Um, the goal of these kind of events from the Ethics Center standpoint is to stimulate critical thinking and civil discourse and civil dialogue about complicated and important issues. So um, with that spirit, let me then begin with a land acknowledgement. The Fresno State campus sits in the midst of the San Joaquin Valley, a valley rich in the traditions and representation of Native American peoples and cultures. We are grateful to be in the traditional homelands of the Yokuts and Mono peoples, whose diverse tribal communities share stewardship over this land. So welcome again. I'm very happy that we could collaborate with Professor Lee Lee Oliver uh, with Fresno State's American Indian Studies program. And I'd also like to thank uh, Ben Cruz, who's in the background here. Ben, this was really Ben's idea. Ben is a student, he's our student assistant. It's so cool when students take leadership on things like this. So Ben, congratulations, you, you were able to pull this together. It's very cool. Um, our panelists are Roman Raintree, Teddy Simon, and Dr. Lee Oliver. So what I'm gonna do is introduce each one of them, then I'll get out of the way and let them talk. Each panelist will have about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we should have plenty of time for discussion at the end. What we're gonna do in the discussion part of this is we're gonna use the Q&A feature. So if you look at your Zoom window on the bottom where it says Q&A, put your questions or comments in the Q&A and then we'll try to respond to them as best we can. Let me just point out that you know, this and every other thing in our culture these days is complicated and difficult and people have views on multiple sides. It's okay if we disagree in this space, but we wanna disagree civilly, reasonably. So I ask please that you're on your best behavior and be polite and kind and generous when you use the Q&A. Okay, so uh, our first speaker will be Roman C. Raintree and he is the Seeds for Sovereignty Community Liaison. He's also the founder of the Rename S Valley Fresno County Coalition and Movement. Fre uh, Roman is here in Fresno with us. Uh, our next speaker will be Teddy Simon, who is Navajo. She is the Indigenous Justice Advocate for the Racial and Economic Justice Program at the ACLU of Northern California. She leads the ACLU of Northern California's work centering on indigenous voices across issue areas, including education, protection of land and sacred sites, and representation. She strives to build deep mutual and meaningful relationships with tribal and indigenous leaders throughout Northern California. Teddy has a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School, and is currently in Oakland, California on unceded Ohlone lands. Then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Lee Lee Oliver, who is a scholar and activist whose work is dedicated to understanding how American Indians, indigenous peoples, and all marginalized peoples experience and respond to national policies and societal beliefs that pose challenges, challenges to their sovereignty, their safety, and their security. Her teaching and writing reflect the transgressive political work of American Indian sovereignty protectors. She has a book manuscript that she's completing, I think. Maybe you'll explain a little bit more about that. The title is Red Feminist Roots, American Indian Women, Coloniality, and the Liturgies of Death and Life. And it focused, that book focuses on the phenomenon of American Indian women's racialization during colonialism and considers how the trope of the S word that we're gonna talk about today how that trope emerges and continues to impact American Indian women's lives today. So really excited to hear from our three panelists. Roman, the space is yours, the time is yours. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, likewise, let's also like to thank Ben 
and you, Dr. Fiala, for uh, providing this space and an opportunity to discuss this topic in a respectful and uh, really uh, humbling manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I'd like to just first start off uh, really acknowledging that um, I'm Dunlap Banamono and Choi Numni, and I am indigenous to the area that is uh, S Valley, Fresno County. Um, there are four tribes there. Um, the other two are uh, the Wakshumni and the Waksachi people that are also recognized as being indigenous to the area. So I would want to uh, not include them as well. Um, I'd like to first start off just showing a, a map of what um, the area kind of looked like um, pre-colonial. Um, you know, what my great, great grandparents uh, would have experienced, would have saw. Um, it's, it's a little bit different than what we kind of experienced today. Uh, right off the bat, what I noticed is that you'll see Tulare Lake, uh, which no longer exists. Um, I like to kind of direct your eyes maybe to up where it says uh, Western Mono Monachi. Um, the Dunlap Banamono, of course, you know, Dunlap Banamono, Dunlap being a town here in um, uh, California, in the foothills just above uh, S Valley. Um, that town didn't exist prior to 1851. So that group of uh, tribal people are actually a conglomerate of both the Wobonunch that you see there and the Etimich that are below there. Um, they're really just kind of uh, two groups that have uh, migrated from what is now like the S Valley up into uh, uh, Kings Canyon National Park. Um, we have a lot of pictographs and ancient villages that are in that park. And if you go down kind of the river, you'll see the Choinumni people as well, kind of just spelled uh, long ways. So that's kind of uh, gives you an idea of uh, where we're at, but more so to, to the south of there, you'll see is where S Valley is today. Um, so I guess I, I like to really just kind of start off with, um, you know, kind of the land is uh, really the center of our universe. Um, the land that you were born onto, I should say, is the center of our universe. It's really the focal point for many of our epistemologies. Now, I can't really talk for all indigenous people and all tribal groups, um, but I do see a lot of par parallels between my own um, indigenous culture and what I was raised to believe uh, with other indigenous people. And I guess the largest thing I really want to touch on is that uh, our spirituality, at least my spirituality, and what I've been taught is largely rooted in the truth. It's kind of like what Gandhi said, and that truth is God. Um, and that's really what we strive for. Um, we recognize that we are Noom. Um, that was the original proposed name of S Valley. Um, right now we're proposing um, Bear Mountain Valley. It's currently being used and occupied in um, S Valley as much as uh, S Valley is currently used. But we proposed Noon Valley initially because Noon means just that, a human being. And that um, we're all communities where we, that transcends uh, racial, religious, economic boundaries. Um, that's what we are, it's just a, a, a human beings. And what is a human being? Well, a human being is someone who's gonna grow from childhood to adulthood, presumably, uh, go through many phases of life. And most importantly, what I've been taught is gonna make mistakes. And with those mistakes, you're gonna learn from them and you're gonna grow from them and you can be better because of them. And so I've been taught that. And with that, it's kind of like uh, understood that a lie can hurt a thousand times over and the ramifications can be you know, very reaching and unseen. And that's kind of what uh, this name is and continuing to perpetuate it. And all we're trying to do is have a discussion about the truth, about what it really means to us and some of our tribal people. And we're not trying to hold anybody responsible for the past, but what we're trying to say, or at least what I'm trying to say is we should be accountable for the present. And when confronted with the truth, you should be accountable for your actions when faced with the truth. What do you do? And some people choose to deny, deny, deny. It's not offensive. It's only offensive to a small minority and they don't matter because they're just that, a minority group. Or do you accept responsibility? Acknowledge the context of which it even got its name and where we're at today with this name. And do you begin to understand? Because through understanding, um, clarifications are made and questions are answered. And it comes through that understanding is empathy, and which begins to bring about that change because the empathy isn't really, um, it's what binds us. You, my pain is now your struggle as well. 
you're my brother, you're my sister. And more importantly, when it comes to the context of the community, you're my neighbor, you're my resident. Um, and that's what really builds a community. And that's what we try to say, what I, at least I try to say, uh, our group is doing. Um, we're trying to build that truth, try to talk about the truth. And changing the name is not gonna change our community. Um, it's actually gonna bring us together. And in fact, it's gonna bring us together because one thing is for sure, while some people might agree with it being offensive and some other people won't, it's 100% agreed upon that it is divisive. And that's contrary to community values. And that's contrary to the Fresno County the guiding principles, the Board of Supervisors guiding principles of a respecting and embracing cultural diversity. So to me, it seems like, are those just words that you say that look pretty, that get you elected, garner your votes, or are we personifying that? And that's what we're asking. You're faced with the truth now, um, and we're accountable for the present, and here we are. So what are we going to do? And are we a community, or are we not? And so just briefly, I'd like to just show one last slide of who we are we. Uh, what, what, who, are, who is our group? Um, who am I? Um, like I said, I'm a lifelong resident of uh, Fresno County. Um, my mother is from Dunlap. Um, my people are from S Valley. I have spent many of my formidable days and summers up there. Um, I, I, I'm a graduate of even Fresno High uh, when it was uh, the mascot in the Warriors. So all this stuff kind of impacted me. And as I spoke up, other people have spoke up and our group has now grown into what can be often be described as a coalition. And it's just not only myself, but other local residents that are indigenous and non-native and other uh, nonprofit organizations like uh, um, the, the Fresno American Indian Health Project. And what we're all trying to do primarily is focus on education and trying to reach those people, including the Board of Supervisors, um, to try to let people know what's happening to our community, how this is a violent attack, and try to connect those dots and really just try to have a cultural exchange, a dialogue, if you will, and uh, no longer be silenced because that's how a lot of us are feeling. So thank you. Th thanks, Roman. That was, that was interesting and, and and passionate. I, I, the stuff about empathy is right on, I think. Um, let's invite Teddy then. Teddy, it's the, the time is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Roman. And, and before I begin, I um, just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Fiala and, and Roman and Lise for including me in this panel. Um, and thanks to all of the attendees um, for joining, especially on this day where we can recognize um, Native American Day here in California. Um, so before I dive into kind of the content, I just wanted to introduce myself and kind of give folks a sense of why, why I'm here and, and why I care um, about these issues. Um, I'm an ind Indigenous justice advocate at the East you of Northern California. I do this work because it's my calling and because it's also my personal story. I grew up um, in the Pacific Northwest. For those of you who know, that's very far from the Navajo Reservation. And that's because of federal Indian policies, including boarding schools and forced relocation. Um, I went to public school. There was no visibility of Indigenous people in the public schools I attended. I remember very distinctly playing the Oregon Trail game, and it was a story about plucky settlers in covered wagons heading west. There were no Native people in those stories. I didn't get to learn my Native language as a kid, um, and in fact, didn't get to learn anything other than high in Navajo until I was in my 30s and went to grad school. Um, it's not all serious. These are um, the best things in my life. This is my nephew and one of my nieces. I love hiking in the Bay Area in Oakland, which is unceded Ohlone territory where I occupy. During the pandemic, I helped form a union at the ACLU. That's me dropping off my union ballot, probably on a work call. And my sister made me run half marathons with her during the pandemic, which is still nuts and ridiculous to me. Um, so for the rest of the time I'm with you, I'm gonna talk about kind of briefly who the ACLU is and our indigenous justice works, just so you have kind of a better sense of why I'm here. And then talk some about history, erasure, invisibility, um, and how the S word relates to ongoing social justice issues. 
and then why we're called to do this work and called to do it together. So briefly about the ACLU, um, the ACLU of Northern California is dedicated to defending and advancing justice, fairness, equality, and freedom. We do that through legal and policy work, including litigation, but also organizing um, and strategic communications um, and advancing civil liberties for all Californians. Um, I work in the Racial and Economic Justice Project and Indigenous Justice is a core area there. Right now we do a lot of work on um, Indigenous education advocacy, protection of sacred sites and land, um, and overlaps with criminal justice, voting rights, uh, and gender sexuality and reproductive justice. So this might be um, old news for lots of folks, and in case you didn't know, uh, California is home to one of the largest Native American populations in the country. Um, has some of our cities have the largest urban Indian populations like Sacramento, Santa Rosa, the Bay Area, certainly LA. There's an it's an incredibly diverse community. Um, over a hundred um, recognized tribes and over seventy unrecognized tribes, each with their own history and culture and language. Um, and amazing things are happening in the state, being led by Indigenous people. Um, the city of Albany, um, close to where I live, just this week passed a resolution to recognize the Ohlone people as the original inhabitants of the land, and we'll start paying a land tax to um, the Sugareate Land Trust here. Um, last year, the city of Eureka gave an island back to the Wiat people. Um, Yurok, Hoopa, and other tribes in the North State are leading what will be the largest dam removal um, in the world to restore salmon and habitat. These are amazing things being led by indigenous people in our state. But indigenous people are, are essentially invisible. And that's not a coincidence or an accident. So it's really critical to put the conversation around place names in a contemporary context. We can't talk about indigenous people today without talking about this history. And this is a history of genocide and erasure. So what is a little known fact, I think, and, and indicative of what we are and aren't taught in the public education system. For many years, the state of California paid white settlers an average of $5 for a head, 25 cents for a scalp for killing native people. This was the state government paying settlers to kill natives. Um, the first year that this was policy, the state paid over a million dollars. That's where the super racist and very recently retired Washington football team name came from. So words have real meaning. Um, I am not going to read this next slide. It, um, it makes me sick as, as a person and an, an indigenous person and an indigenous woman, woman. This is taken from an 1861 article in the Marysville, Marysville Daily Appeal. Um, and this just really speaks to this image of indigenous women that was that was commonly held at the time, which is women are supplies for labor or lust and to be disposed of. So this new this new world, which in the Pacific Northwest was uh, kind of exemplified by the Oregon Trail here in California, it's the gold rush, right? It's this resource rich environment to be taken advantage of and it's land for farming, it's forest for lumber and it's gold. And there's this entire population of people, Indians that are in the way of that. So we create systems to solve the Indian problem, which is to render indigenous people a thing of the past. How do you get rid of people? Well, obviously, right, we've already talked about murder and genocide. You also erase people from your public discourse and public imagination, and you do that through policies of assimilation. Residential boarding schools were a huge piece of that, which was to kill the Indian and save the man. And how do you justify taking indigenous children from their families and sending them to these, these really traumatic and harmful boarding schools is you evoke an image of indigenous people as uncivilized and backwards and savage, and you paint indigenous women as unfit to be mothers. So there are countless federal reports from this time up through the 90s that refer to the poor parenting and poor hygiene of indigenous women 
that didn't just justify child removal, but really demanded that as you know, as good citizens and as good government, we protect native children by removing them from their homes and often sending them to places where they would become white. They would stop speaking their languages. They would stop practicing their, their traditions and, and their culture. And that continues today. Today, Native American children are vastly overrepresented in the foster care system and often placed in non-native families. Um, a recent study, and this really stood out to me, a recent study found that um, due in large part to systemic bias, where abuse has been reported, a Native household is two times more likely to be investigated than a non-Native household, two times more likely to have allegations of abuse substantiated, and four times more likely to be placed in foster care than white children. This is systemic bias against Indigenous people, and especially against Indigenous women, and it's that S word image that we're still relying on to do this. And again, Indigenous voices are just very rarely heard or listened to. And um, so for me, it's, it's our collective responsibility to recognize history, to learn from it, to learn it, and to build relationships and move forward in a good way. We're all occupying Indigenous land and almost all of us are here because of this history. So what's the ACLU's role in all of this? As the ACLU, we defend and advance civil liberties, but here's kind of a somewhat of a rhetorical question, which is how can you exercise your most fundamental civil rights, participate fully in your democracy, live with equal dignity, if the place where you live represents this historical trauma and modern day discrimination? And more, if your home evokes an image of you as disposable or the object of someone's lust, or as an identity that is to be erased. How people see themselves and how other people see them really matters. And so when we devalue people, impose these stereotypes, talk about entire peoples in the past tense, all of that really matters. Um, so as we talked about a little bit with our Indigenous justice work, our role um, is to support. So um, as Roman already shared, the, the coalition is really led by Indigenous people and residents. And we are here in a supportive role to you know, pressure public elected officials to engage in public education and to raise awareness. Um, Lisa is gonna talk about all of this in, in just um, a moment. Um, but I really love Illuminatives and some of their social media stuff. And so I just wanted to share this because I think it says so much, which is this is not a difficult issue at the end of the day. Um, and this is about the, the Kansas City Chiefs um, sports team for folks who don't recognize that. Um, and there's a lot that you all can do. Um, you can join and support the coalition. If you're not in the Central Valley, I guarantee there are similar efforts happening where you are that you can get plugged into. Um, the ACLU is having a training um, in November that you are welcome to attend and join us for. Um, learn, educate yourself, support Indigenous artists, read books written by Indigenous authors and films and TV shows um, that are now finally coming out, and really spread the word um, and educate others. So this last slide is just some resources and links, which maybe we can send around afterwards, um, but I will end my comments there and look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. That was, that was great and informative. Um, if, can I suggest if there's, if there's a couple of those resources that you wanna share as we proceed, feel free to put them in the chat. People can get a hold of information that way. Um, and before I ask uh, Professor Lee Oliver to speak, just to remind the audience, use the Q&A. If you have questions or things come up, feel free to post them there and we'll, we'll try to respond. So uh, Dr. Ol Lee Oliver, it's, the time is yours. Feel free to go ahead. My apologies, I have to unmute first. Okay, next Sakoa. I am Lee Oliver, I am Blackfeet, and um, 
uh, descendant of the Choctaw Nations. And uh, I am thrilled to be here. I want to just give all my love and, and um, support and appreciation to my brother Roman for your ongoing effort. And I know it is um, often feels like a, an uphill battle, even when you have successes, right? And, and which you are, um, including this and reaching so many people for such an important issue. This is an issue about our wellness. It's a, an issue about the state of the nation we um, share as people in the United States. It's about what we mean when we say pluralism and democracy. And um, so it's, it's a small um, change to make relative to what is wrong with keeping uh, names like this. So I'm going to go ahead and um, try to get back to my screen sharing, but I will go ahead also and, and um, get started with my presentation. So um, I also want to thank Ben, um, who put so much of this together. Um, and this ties into the end of my presentation, which is why, why are we doing this? Um, it's to rectify the past and it's also for the future. We, we, we owe you, the new generations, a better future than we look like we're about to hand you. So um, these images here are all different native women who suffered and continue to suffer under this idea of what the S word um, says about native women and um, so as, as some of us, so many of us in our um, communities know, we don't separate off and only work on issues that affect women and only work on issues that right, affect men or boys or children, et cetera. You put your time and energy where it needs to be. And so any selection of um, images around women or talking about women today is because I'm trying to bring the point to the amazing work that women do in the face of this type of racist misogyny. So you see people on this page like Winona LaDuke, who continues to be a water protector, who continues to support her own people and, and go and travel and fight for others. Some of you may have been fortunate to hear her um, talk last year when she visited out here. She's an incredibly generous um, and kind and energetic activist. Um, Wilma Mankiller, all right, another, great leader um, who in spite of that kind of treatment publicly just kept pushing forward. She lived a good long life and she did so much good work in, in her lifetime. Janet McLeod is another name to know, right? Because she's over here on the left with Dick Gregory. She used to speak a lot um, and still has many um, pieces of writing out there about the rights of native people and about the push of who and what solidarity work looks like, right? That to really be in service of the people who are in a fight, we need to get behind them. So I say that also as a descendant of the Blackfeet and Choctaw Nations, I'm absolutely grateful to be here and be a guest and be welcomed and embraced by the Choinumni, by the Wukchemni, right? By the greater Yoka peoples and Mono people, by the, the larger, um, urban Indian community. I'm an urban Indian. I was raised that way. Um, I've come up in a couple of communities and I'm grateful to my elders for um, teaching me how to do this work. Um, and so I'm here to serve. I'm here to teach. I'm here to be a part of this. It is, as Teddy calls it, a calling. So just briefly, I'm not going to read everything that's on the slides, but um, just briefly, this notion um, we can kind of get our head around is that colonial laws needed in order to justify expansion, genocidal activity, enslavement, all of which they did throughout the Americas here in California as well. Um, the term squaw became a figure and a way to write into law a lesser valued human and in fact, a less than human person in um, the context of Native Americans. The term Indian, which is still present all over federal Indian law, Indian country, right? These terms were used to literally reduce a people to be less civilized. When you write people into law in a way that redefines their humanity and lowers the standard of it, 
you can treat them any kind of way. So for Native Americans, the term squaw is rooted in that history and it's left this long legacy. Another S word is the word savage that even today, the younger generations use to mean like cool, radical, hardcore, right? Things I guess come from my, my youth and um, heavy metal music maybe, <laughs> uh, but uh, savage, right? This is not a good word either. So partly we, who I think we need to move to be more intentional. You have figures like Susan Schoen Harjo, um, who I put the Oprah talk because in 1992, she met Oprah, spoke on her show, and she said, you need, you as a nation need to stop promoting this term squaw as if it means woman. It does not. There's SQA at the end or beginning or in different native languages. Um, it did not mean woman or women. Right. In fact, so many people like um, Harjo have tried to do a lot of work to say, look, you're misaligning. So if your justification for maintaining the, the word as a place name, right, um, is so important, let's look at the word, right? And let's understand what Roman said is the truth. It does not mean woman. In some written um, periods and pieces, um, buck and squaw and papoose are, are written to mean male, female, and child. These are things, these are animals, these align human beings, not with other humans, but with the animal world. In this um, quote, this is a person, William Bright. If you do this research or you're just interested, I highly recommend um, reading this. He goes into um, what words mean, the semantics of them. And what I look at is when those semantics get placed in the law, what are you going to do? Okay. In the 1600s, we already had the, prevent, the presence of this notion um, that Disney keeps playing over and over for the public. It keeps reifying the notion of this, this coy, flirtatious little girl, right, who went after a grown man, defended him. It, plays out her father as this um, very um, inhumane leader, which he was not. And the tribe themselves, the, the um, uh, Mataponi people of the Powhatan nation have actually um, translated their history from about 1606 to 1611 to expose what really happened. They literally had translations of their oral history. And it's in a book called, um, the true story of Pocahontas, I promise you, you will have wished you read it. When you get through it, you'll see that this had to do with a way to manipulate the way that the English crown saw the Powhatan people, right? So they kept paying for those who came to settle and stay and take over what becomes the tobacco industry in the United States. If you didn't know that, you actually don't know the history of Pocahontas. I didn't know it either. This is not a finger pointing. This is a revelation. Why call for a change? Because our relationship to land reminds us of, of who we are. It defines us as native people, how we relate, connect, respond to land, to water, to trees is part of our spirituality. Now, not every native American um, carries on those traditions, but many, many of us do. And we have the right to, we have the religious right to, we have the United Nations right to, right? But also a lot of people who wanna keep the S word um, as a place name, they feel very connected to that place. It tells them something about who they are. The defense that there's nothing wrong with this word because it doesn't bother me, right? Maybe what Harjo says is that misalignment with the truth as Roman says. Maybe that you don't care if something is referred to in that derogatory way, but it may be that it doesn't um, affect us all in the same way, right? So in our relationship to place, land is instructive to us about who we are. It teaches us, I don't care if you're an Italian American and you have a story about your ancestors, and they came to and created a life in a place, that place is instructive to you. And it's instructive to us as native people. 
And that's where part of what Roman said, that conflict exists. Who has the right to say? And for that, I think we have to think about the outcome. This is a photograph of um, the cartoon at the bottom is, um, uh, was drawn by a child who had gotten to go on this field trip with all of his classmates because they got good grades and good behavior. They were promised they could go to the local um, hockey game and they'd all be taken on this field trip. They were so excited. And when they got there, grown adults behind them in the bleachers started throwing these big plastic cups full of beer at them, telling them to go home, which is ironic, quite frankly. Um, and yelling things like, um, we're Americans, right? You're not Americans, right? These were children. These were grade school children. So one of the kids drew this picture and I think it's really useful because all of this causes us to feel feelings, to have feelings about ourselves, to have feelings about each other, right? So this child drew this cartoon. This is how we were before the trip. And this is what we look like on the bus after. They were saddened. Many of the adults that were getting um, threatened with being thrown out of the game argued that it was because the children didn't stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. And how dare they, right? So all protections of adult to children, first of all, if you read and do the research on that, it did not happen. They did not not stand up, but it's also their right not to stand up. And what is it that takes off the, um, the responsibility of adults to children, right? We are seeing some changes. We're seeing in Tahoe, they're now gonna call an area they used to call Squaw Valley Palisades instead. It took a very long time. Washoe tribe worked for ages. And this is exactly why. The word itself is a constant reminder of the unjust treatment of native people. The place reminds you it's instructive. You feel some kind of way. You can feel bad for the land, all that it was a part of, and you feel bad for yourself, your people. It's a reminder of what your own relatives suffered. Colorado, you're seeing this kind of change where the governor of Colorado recently, sorry, set myself alarm. The, um, the governor of Colorado actually signed an executive order to, um, get rid of a law that had made way for genocidal violence against Cheyenne and Arapaho people. So we are seeing changes unfolding and I think we can learn from them, right? But we have this continuation of this issue of missing and murdered women, girls, transgender, native people, two-spirit native people. We face 10 times higher rate of murder homicide than any other people in the US. 86% of that violence is committed by white males and the effort to search for missing Native American women and girls is five days. So if anybody police otherwise start to look, it's a five day lag time before that even starts. That's across the nation. This is a feeling about Native women that allows for the violence and allows to overlook it. So why, why does all this matter to me? When I think about it, I think about treaties. We make treaties because legally, we are supposed to say we agree to coexist, right? And neither side can make changes to it without the agreement of the other. Because we're a pluralist nation, because we have a social contract, right? Because we can actually make these changes. And I think we should. Our spiritual, physical, and mental health depend on it. And because our youth deserve better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Lee Oliver. Um, let me just invite our audience to put, uh, if you have anything you wanna hear about or talk about, put it in the Q&A. Um, a couple of questions were already answered there. So I don't know, Teddy or Roman, if you guys were keeping track of that, if there's anything that you wanna share with folks. And then maybe if you guys want to respond to each other, just swing it back to Roman. Anything you wanted to add after you heard um, Teddy and Lise speak? Anything else you want to add? Yeah, I'd just like to, again, thank everybody. Um, you know, it goes back to what uh, Lise was saying, Lise. Um, it kind of brought up the notion of uh, seven generations. That's a very key thing, a way of thinking in uh, many indigenous communities where um, the decisions we make today 
we have to consider the ramifications for seven generations. And so I think uh, a lot of people don't uh, really realize that um, these talks and our efforts and people returning after these talks and going back to their homes and uh, reading the newspaper and dialoguing and talking about this, that this is what the beginning of healing looks like. Um, sharing, opening up and having candid discussions. And sometimes a candid discussion is going to be, um, you know, uh, a little bit too much to handle sometimes. But I think of it as uh, our community, if you will, if you personify it as uh, someone who has experienced a traumatic event in their life, it's going to take time. And that through that time, they begin to heal when they begin to open up and begin to discuss the traumatic event. And that's kind of us in our community. We're opening up after feeling silenced and marginalized for so long um, that we can are being heard and are being received. And we're grateful for that. And we hope that um, people recognize that all of you coming together and continuing this are helping and are aiding in that healing process and to realize your own uh, medicine and your own power as an individual. And that's really going back to what it means in our indigenous community to have your individual power and your medicine and to hold on to it dearly and to guard it because um, this is the healing process, just talking to one another. And um, this is how, like Lisi said, we uh, uh, provide a better uh, future for tomorrow um, by addressing these issues today. Can, can I ask a kind of a naive question um, about the history of this place in our county? Where did that name originally come from? And I also have heard that there's a place called S word leap that has a kind of negative connotation. Can you guys just give us a little bit of that local history? Uh, well, there's been uh, several um, um, renditions, I guess several stories or explanations, but I don't think there's ever been any kind of true or one definitive uh, way of how uh, S Valley Fresno County got its name. And I think a lot of times it's actually even confused uh, with how S Valley up north in uh, Nevada got its name. Um, I've read that, you know, some people have came in, the, the early settlers have come in, said that um, in the area, so to speak, that they only found women and children. So they called it S Valley. Um, that's something I've heard also connected with up north in Nevada. Um, something I've heard recently um, through the Fresno Bees article in interviewing other people, um, in S Valley, they said that if you look it on a map, S Valley kind of looks like a, a shoe is what I was told. And, and they said it was like a, a woman's moccasin. And so that's how it got its name. Um, I haven't in the year that I've been trying to research really found a definitive clear cut answer as to, I've been able to find uh, reasons as to why it was uh, changed. It's only been changed from one word to two words, um, but nothing like that. Um, and of course, the tribes have always had their names for it, but um, the Choinemni language is rooted more or less in the Yokut language, and the Mono language is rooted in a different language. So there's different words to refer to the same area. So there's not one greed upon word, um, unfortunately. I don't know either. Um, I've, I've looked and looked and looked to try to find why someone, the reason behind it, not when. You find a lot of dates. You find a lot of stories around the person who is argued to have settled there um, as the first non-native person. Um, but it's always very celebratory or, you know, it could be like a little bit of a sad story about them, but never gets down to why they, they if they really did, why they chose that particular word. Um, there is a lot of um, writing, I'm trying to think of the, the field of it, but there's a lot of writing in sort of like history writing that goes into feminist writing. Um, and also some writing about histories in um, Europe in, about times when there was this conceptualizing of land as woman 
right? We see the same with ships, with um, and this this idea that men steward the ship, men steward the land, right? And so even that research indicates this sort of um, domination of men over other. Um, but that so far, um, I was really frankly disappointed to see that um, as much as I was reading and reading and reading, um, I couldn't find anything yet where somebody expressed, you know, I chose this word because. And I think it's honestly, considering we understand the abject violence that was being um, deployed against Native people, um, it's really hard to except that it may have been something as innocuous as like, oh, it looked like a lady's shoe. First of all, you didn't see her as a, a lady, let alone woman. Um, and it's kind of similar to the, the stories around, um, there was a great effort for a while to say that um, Cristobal Colon or Christopher Columbus, that we call him in the US, um, that he thought um, that he came up with the term Indian because coming across native people, indigenous people, he thought of, they're so beautiful. He said, they're so close to God that he was actually saying in Dios, they're like inhabited with this God-like that he did not treat them like that in his own um, diaries, his own journals, ex expansion journals, um, tell the real tales of, the, of his, not only having people tortured um, for a variety of ways to exploit them and punish and all this gross stuff, um, but also just for his entertainment. And so we know that kind of sadism um, was in him because he tells us in his own records, but that, that's, that's all I've been able to uh, grasp so far. One of the things that has been really interesting about supporting this campaign is that, you know, and, and this is true um, for a lot of these, different kinds of changes and movements and efforts is when we're implicated in something that is challenging um, and that challenges like our concept of who we are and where we are and, and our shared history, people really hold tight to, to what they know. Um, and so we've seen that in this campaign where, um, where folks have said, but this is the way it's always been. It's not offensive to me. Um, and and in some ways, you know, it's a it's a good question and it's an interesting question. And in addition to that, it doesn't matter kind of how the the how the this place came to have its name. What matters is that the indigenous people of that area and also of you know the entire world are saying this is causing us harm. And so it's incumbent upon us to listen to that and to really hear that. And one thing that we've heard in response um, in, in local media from um, some of the members of the Board of Supervisors is that this is, you know, just a part of woke cancel culture, or that there are outside organizations coming in saying, you know, this is what we in the Central Valley have to do, like us on the coast coming in. Um, and to me, it's, that's deeply offensive and is just illustrative of this continued desire to silence indigenous voices, which is you see Roman on this call and Lise and other people in the community who identify as indigenous and who identify as allies. And even in the chat this evening saying we're from this place and we don't want this to be our name. Um, and still this effort to kind of silence um, the voices uh, is, is really sad. Um, but we also can still continue to learn and just participating in this coalition, you know, Roman can tell you I've messed up a bunch of times and he has been so gracious and grateful to continue to educate me and all of us um, in, in how to be better and, and how to build this community together. Um, just jump in with another quick, thank you for that. That's, I think you're, you're right. Like, it doesn't matter. You, you, you persuaded me. It doesn't matter where, where the history came from. This is just a like a, a legal question. And it's, it's kind of prompted by something I heard Lise say that um, like the, the powerful write the laws. And so these names are are created by the folks in power. Right. It's a it's a artifact of the system of power. Um, today who writes the laws and today who has the power to rename things, right? How, how does like the nuts and bolts of this work? What's the, 
who gets to choose what what things are called? I, I mean, again, just a kind of naive question, but just to prompt your thoughts about both here and then like, what do you do to make something like this happen? Well, I guess the short answer would be uh, locally, it's the Board of Supervisors. So in our case, uh, S Valley Fresno County Board of Supervisor is represented by Nathan Maxig. And uh, Mr. Maxig has um, had no interest whatsoever in even hearing a discussion of uh, what we are asking for and why we're asking for it. And he's basically shut the door on us and told us that it is what it is and it's not going to change until he sees that enough people who are his constituents um, show interest, then he'll show interest. So uh, that's kind of where we're at. So. Uh, We've gone to the Board of Supervisors and mind you, uh, he doesn't want to talk to us. So we have to utilize the, the public comment section. So you go in about 10 in the morning and you wait and wait and about one o'clock is the public comments after their meeting and you get two minutes. So <laughs> uh, that's where he's relegated to us. And it's uh, familiar territory, you know, it's pretty par for the course. Um, it's pretty, uh, which you would expect from a government official and being native, um, go home, go away. And that's kind of where we're at. So with that, we find that education is probably our best tool. Um, the pin is mightier than the sword. So how do we connect with you? Um, I, I kind of feel really drawn to art. Art speaks for itself, much like the truth. And um, it connects with people and much like the truth. And then that's what, I feel like we're banking on is that when you hear the truth and you're confronted with the truth, what are you going to do? And are you prepared to live with that? And that's what I've repeatedly asked a mathematics. History is judging you right now. And which side are you going to be on Mr. Maxig? And um, if uh, with uh, the board of supervisors, there's all the uh, other uh, resources we can do at the legislative level. Um, we'd like to, long-term go, if possible, have a piece of legislation introduced to Sacramento where it takes care of this word uh, throughout the state. Maine has done it. Maine has successfully redefined what offensive language means, and it, it now includes the S word, and they even revised it so it includes variations of the spelling of the S word. Uh, so literally overnight, communities, landmarks, all had to change. And I like to see that for California as well. It'd be really nice to see the most tribally diverse state in the union who has the most non fairly recognized tribes, which are all the tribes located in indigenous to S Valley, um, see a little recognition. Teddy, do you wanna explain some of the stuff you put in the chat? Cause that, I mean, that comes right off of what Roman was just saying. Yeah, sure. So there are um, there are at least 10 states that have passed legislation to mandate the removal of this term from state and local lands. Um, and as folks might imagine, there's just such a such a broad swath of jurisdiction over who owns the land. And so then who has the legal ability to change it, um, which is what makes this so bureaucratic and slow and complicated. Um, but 10 states have taken that action. There's national legislation um, moving forward right now. Uh, I put a link to a, a great Wilderness Society article um, about that. Um, and then there are also federal agencies like the USDA Forest Service who have chosen to remove this term um, and not use it moving forward. Um, and I think to kind of speak to what Roman was saying, you know, who has the legal power and the power on the books and in writing is one question. And then who is building the power from the ground up to push people in those formal positions, those formal elected positions um, to do that work is, is another thing. Um, and so this, this group of people, this movement is really building that power from the ground up to pressure the folks um, who who can make the decisions um, to do the right thing. And I think this is all also linked to where it's happening at the state level in the Truth and Healing Council, 
um, that um, was created by Governor Newsom, but is le being led by um, 12 tribal representatives. Thank you. I'm, I'm just looking at our clock and to be mindful of uh, our audience's time and your all's time. I wonder if I could ask each of you to offer a, a couple of parting thoughts. Um, and uh, maybe we'll conclude with Roman. And Roman, if you saw there was a, a in the Q&A, there was a comment for you um, about some of these other derogatory names that we've been able to get rid of. So I, maybe we come back to you, but maybe we could start with Teddy, then go to Lise and then conclude with Roman with a couple of parting comments. Go ahead, Teddy. Yes, um, just thank you all um, for, for the invitation and opportunity um, and for joining for this important conversation um, on Native American Day. Um, it's just really an honor to be here um, and to be part of this really important movement and conversation. Yeah, thank everybody too. It's always great to work with uh, Roman and Teddy as well. I always learn so much every time. Um, I would put a plug for um, continuing to really explore what your fight looks like. Any kind of um, challenge, especially when the avenues for change are being controlled by someone else, learn the avenues, right? Um, words matter and the laws matter. I think for me, the history does matter. Uh, because the history and the intention of why people are trying to keep it is part of the struggle we have, right? And all this misinformation about whether the original meaning was derogatory or not, like, no, it doesn't matter anymore. But to people who are resistant, it absolutely matters, and it's what they hang their hat on. So I would say that, yeah, always take a look. And again, I just, um, you know, give all my love and support um, to my brother Roman uh, for your ongoing efforts because what you're doing is good for us. It's good for all of us and I appreciate you continuing to do this fight and um, you know we're with you and in all the different ways you sometimes have to build coalition. It's not pretty, it's not obvious, um, it, it doesn't, it's not what movies look like right? It's just the gritty hard work of social change and justice. And um, I'm honored to be a part of it. And uh, just thank you for your, your work. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Ferrell. And thank you, Ben, again. Uh, I can't thank you guys enough. Appreciate having you both, Teddy, Elise. Uh, thank you. It's a very big honor for me. Um, to answer the question in the Q&A, where they were saying um, the, the United States Board on Geographic Naming has uh, already banned two words, the J word and the N word. And um, we can't understand why um, the S word cannot be included as well. It's specific to only Native American women. Uh, the reasoning is clear on their website. They say it's because a handful, a few tribes back East, um, they state that they've always regarded that word as just meaning something as non-derogatory, as simple as maybe as a woman. But they also acknowledge that neighboring tribes right next to those communities regard the word as the antithesis, as very dehumanizing as we interpret it here on the West Coast. Um, that is the only reason why just those handful of tribes. Um, I wish they would. It would be really nice. It's something specific to us. Um, I really like to see, uh, I see that at six o'clock. I just like to direct everybody, you know, if you could uh, go to our petition at change.org, sign it. And even um, if you feel like it, reach out to Supervisor Maxick and let your voice be heard. And thank you. It's been a real big honor. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you, Roman, and thank you, Teddy, and thank you, Lise. Uh, this is, I, 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 my eyes are open a little bit. I mean, this is amazing what you guys are doing, uh, open both to the issue and to Roman. It's a, it's a pleasure to meet you as someone, you know, doing something cool in our community. So um, bravo. Thank you uh, to the three of you, and thanks to our audience for joining us. If you're looking for the video of this, we'll put it up on our YouTube site um, as soon as we can. And it's also on our Facebook site. So thank you guys for joining us uh, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Appreciate it. Thank you. God bless.